Hey everybody, Casey here with Life After Gaming, and I want to talk about a topic that has been steadily growing within the gaming industry for the last several years, but has more recently garnered renewed outrage. Let's talk about microtransactions in games. Microtransactions are literally defined as small monetary transactions that occur online, but within the context of video games, a microtransaction can range from under a dollar to a single purchase of up to and over $100. To the gaming world, any purchase for a game that isn't downloadable content or DLC, which adds additional playable content or characters, is generally considered a microtransaction. Examples of microtransaction content would be visual character changes, cosmetic items to decorate in-game characters or in-game locations, lump sums of in-game currency, and the most controversial of them all, loot boxes which contain a random mix of any of the others I've just described. Ever since the rise of mobile gaming, they've pretty much become commonplace. While initially it was more heavily associated with the smaller app store space, today a variety of games at every level of the industry are implementing some form of microtransactions. And it's not very difficult to see why. In the mobile space, the developer Supercell is behind one of the most popular games called Clash of Clans. They make three other highly successful mobile titles as well, Boom Beach, Heyday, and Clash Royale. Every one of their games is free to play, but thanks to the microtransactions that net you in-game currency, which is essential to the game's progression, as of 2016, Routers reports that the company had generated $2.3 billion in revenue. For comparison, that puts Supercell, a 150 plus person studio, just underneath the likes of Bethesda, Ubisoft, and EA, some of the largest publishers slash developers in the industry. Stories like this are the direct result of the larger games industry implementing microtransactions in their titles. They desperately need a way to make more money for the games they released since more advanced technology and hardware requires exponentially more staff and development costs. Yet games continue to retail at a range of $40 to $60. So when you consider the fact that the home console games used to be about the same price or higher, with inflation, we're currently underpaying for our new games. This is partly why DLC came about. It pumps more money into a single game, though it has its own development costs, since it's, as I said before, actual additional content. Remember when a bunch of games required you to buy an online pass if you didn't get the game new at full price? Luckily that didn't last long, but it was another attempt to recoup the cost of development since the second-hand market generates literally no money for publishers and developers. Microtransactions honestly solve a lot of their problems, so as a patron and a fan of the gaming industry, I can totally see why they would want to do this. It may even be necessary for games to continue to exist the way we know them. But the problem is most definitely with the implementation, which has gotten so out of hand in some instances, consumer organizations are being called in to investigate. I'm going to provide you with a few examples of very big game companies using microtransactions in their games and my personal perception of how well they managed to implement them. Grand Theft Auto V by Rockstar Games is one of the best examples of microtransactions done right. Their multiplayer mode GTA Online is wildly popular, and they've managed to put out free brand new content for it on a fairly regular basis since it was released all the way back in 2013. The entirety of the GTA Online economy is fueled by in-game currency. It allows players to buy property in-game that grants you access to the newer content and so long as you put in the time, you can save up the money to do everything without spending a single real-world dollar past the purchase of the game. Conversely, if you don't have the time and want to jump into the new stuff immediately, you can buy shark cards for real money that grants you lump sums of in-game cash. That cash can be used indiscriminately on anything in that online world, so players are free to really play the game the way they want to, either for free or with the added bonus of saving time on grinding. I feel like this works for two main reasons. There's nothing you can get access to in the game for real money that you can't if you don't spend anything. And secondly, there's nothing about GTA Online's gameplay that gives somebody who's paying a lot of real money an unfair advantage in any meaningful way. GTA is not a very competitive game in that regard, and that really works to its advantage in this situation. Ignoring GTA 5's base game sales, GTA Online has brought in over $500 million in revenue as of April of 2015. 
Blizzard, on the other hand, is behind a number of very competitive games that include microtransactions. Focusing on the hero shooter Overwatch, their implementation is what I would consider to be okay. It's not as ideal as Grand Theft Auto, but it works well for that specific game. You're only able to buy loot boxes that contain random cosmetic items for the various characters in-game. Some items are more rare than others, but none of them add any new functionality to the game. They're strictly cosmetic. On top of that, you can earn loot boxes for free by just playing the game. I'm a fan of this kind of microtransaction because it makes sure not to interfere with any gameplay mechanics. You can go your entire life never opening a loot box and you'll have the same gameplay experience as anyone else. My criticism comes from the fact that the loot boxes are totally random. If I pay money for a certain number of loot boxes, in most cases it's not because I just want loot boxes, it's because I'm hoping one of those boxes will give me something I do want. Overwatch does not allow you to pay directly for anything, so in that sense it's a relative gamble. When you pay into the system, you only have a chance to get what you want, and I can't get behind that. There is the in-game currency gold, but that's also awarded to you randomly. Getting enough gold does allow you to specifically buy what you want, so that's appreciated, but not enough of a consolation to me. While I couldn't find the exact number of revenue from just their loot boxes, Overwatch overall has pulled in about a billion dollars in sales. If we remove the 7 million copies sold across PC for $40 and console for $60, my very, very rough math would put their profit from just microtransactions at around $650 million. You might have heard about EA in the news regarding Star Wars Battlefront 2 and their wholly awful implementation of microtransactions. I haven't played Battlefront 2, but from what I've read about the game when it launched is that it also used the loot box system. But rather than only granting you cosmetic items upon opening them, you could also get items called star cards, which have tangible effects on the characters you play. In fact, the star cards are the only way to customize and upgrade your characters, and you can only obtain them by earning or outright buying loot boxes. EA failed in almost every aspect of their implementation. They let the random rewards of loot boxes dictate core gameplay progression, as well as made it possible to speed up that progression by spending real money, which would grant those players advantages over others who don't, in a competitive first-person shooter. The outrage from fans was so massive that the story was picked up by major national news outlets like CNN, and it was rumored to have prompted a phone call directly from Disney CEO Bob Iger to EA to fix the mess. This firestorm also prompted the Belgium Gambling Authority to launch investigations into whether or not the loot box systems in both Battlefront and Overwatch constituted gambling. GameSpot put out a good summary video of the entire fiasco as it stands, so give that a look if you want a more detailed recount. I'll put a link in the description. But do know that as of now, they've removed all microtransactions from the game entirely until some future time. Despite that, EA Sports Games, which have been using a microtransaction-fueled card trading system in its Ultimate Team mode, has made about $650 million as well. As a consumer, it's easy to find fault with a company that's nickel and diming you. We all want to feel like we're getting what we paid for and with video games that used to be a singular experience. But today there's so much more that goes into delivering a game, especially when it has online components. The industry has to adapt to survive, and I for one want it to. But we as the players do have the power to dictate what we're willing to accept. It's our money that feeds these good or bad ideas, and so far we've proven that microtransactions in console games are here to stay. It's up to us though to let game companies know that there are lines they shouldn't cross, and we do that by not buying those games, or at least not putting money into their in-game stores. So, what are your thoughts on microtransactions? Are there any games that you think use them well or use them terribly? Let us know. We're listening.